Well, it's been a year and a half since Haitian President Jovenel Moïse was assassinated in his home. Arrests have been made in the case, but no one has gone to trial for the murder. Not to mention, the country still has yet to choose a successor. Now comes a fresh perspective on the chain of events and the cast of characters who may have had a hand in the killing of the world leader. And no one has been covering this story now more than the person next to me. She's a Pulitzer Prize finalist, Emmy Award winner, and Miami Herald journalist Jacqueline Charles. Thank you so much, Jackie, for joining me on Voices this morning. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, I, I am just, uh, first off, before we begin, I have to say uh, you're an incredible journalist. Uh, your excellent shows in your work and what you've covered. I think you've won practically, you heard just a list of a few <laughs> awards that she's won, but she is known for being an excellent journalist. And you've covered Haiti now uh, for more than a decade. And, uh, and, and and what we're about to dive into is the, like, who done it? Made in Miami. <laughs> so what did you uncover in your reportings? Well, you know, in this reporting, Made in Miami, which is essentially taking a look at the plot to oust Haitian President Jovenel Moise, which started here, or at least partly was rooted in South Florida, and then eventually it led to his murder. Um, we're still trying to figure out all of the pieces together, but what we, you know, discover is, first of all, that there are a number of individuals, um, at least three of them, Haitian Americans, with ties to South Florida, who are currently in jail in Port-au-Prince. Uh, there were meetings here, but these meetings were about, you know, one particular person, uh, Mr. Sano, who's a physician, a pastor, Christian Sano, who wanted to replace Jovenel as president. Now, I actually interviewed him in jail in Haiti a couple of months ago, wow. and he denies that, you know, that he wanted to replace Jovenel, but all of the evidence is there that at least there were meetings about saving Haiti. But somehow, this idea of saving Haiti and replacing Jovenel Moise, who at the time of his death was controversial, he, um, there were a lot of anti-government protesting, um, he was accused of trying to be Latin American and the Caribbean's next dictator. So you have to remember the period in which this took place. And then, yes, somehow it evolved into an assassination in the middle of the night with the president um, calling for help in those last few minutes. I broke that story, um, just giving you sort of a TikTok. You know, at 142, he called the police chief. Then a few minutes later, he called him again. He called the head of his security. He called the person in charge of his security Saying coordinator. Saying that his life is in danger. Say, yes, come Where help me. Come Where help are you? Me. Yes. Uh, and, and you broke this down at the very beginning on how you start the Made in Miami series. Folks, you just saw a little glimpse of that with the animation. And, and you then go on after you go through the assassination process. You started off by saying there is a saying in the heart of every Haitian, there is a sleeping president, end quote. Why, why did you start off like that? I started off like this because I have been covering Haiti for more than a decade, probably more than two <laughs> decades. But, you know, when you talk to Haitians and you're in Haiti, that's what you see. Like, everybody wants to be the president of this country. Wow. The house is literally collapsing and everybody's trying to run in rather than to run out of it. And so that was the thing that kept coming up where we saw that there were people who wanted to take charge of this country and in the murder of Haitian President Jovenel Moise somebody wanted to be president or they wa or they wanted this. I mean, one of the stories we did was how the Colombians who were accused in the assassination, they had spent a month in Haiti. They were supposed to be paid up to $3,000. They never got paid. And then in the final hours, right before the assassination, they're told the plan has changed. It's no longer to arrest the president, but it is to assassinate him. And by the way, there's $45 million or so inside the president's house. Now, we don't know if there was actually this money. No one's been able to confirm. What we have um, on testimony is that people said there were suitcases of cash that was taken out. But in the head of these guys, there was $45 million. So this turned into a money heist, and they went in. And, 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 and then they took pictures. Then they took pictures. They, they sent the pictures somewhere, basically to confirm that he was dead. 
yes. and and sent those pictures somewhere. This is this is based on your reporting, and uh, and I found it fascinating. I mean, just a horrible, horrible uh, tragedy, a horrible death, by the way. Twelve wounds. Yeah. Uh, he was shot from head, almost from head to toe. Uh, is I mean, pr pretty disturbing. His eye gouged out and everything else, and they're they're taking pictures to send as proof. And I have to tell you, when you read the Haitian police investigative report, and they did a very good job in terms of just the questioning of the suspects, what you find is the suspect says, hey, yes, I was at the president's house, I was on a compound, but we didn't kill him. We didn't pull the trigger, you know? So you have no one admitting that they actually did it. You know, you have where we know that they went out in teams, yeah. um, according to the police, and there were Delta teams, and then there was another team that came later on. The um, two Haitian Americans um, that have been implicated in there who were acting as translators, so they say, but they were also, when it was on a bullhorn, this is a DEA operation, right. they said that they never actually went inside the house. One of the suspects who's currently in jail here in federal custody in Miami, Mario Antonio Palacios Palacios, who's Colombian, he says, yes, I, I was part of the Delta team. I was told on the, on the 6th of June that the plan had changed to assassinate the president, but I wasn't in the room. So there's still a lot to unravel in terms of who's telling the truth and what actually happened on July 7th. Well, okay, so South Florida recently marked 50 years since the first documented boat of Haitian refugees yes. arrived here in South Florida. You wrote about it, so what's the last half century been like since then? You know, um, part of this package also was the history of Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. To tell you that the last presidential assassination happened a century prior to this. And this is a country, it is the first black republic, but it's been difficult. And democracy has been a very difficult exercise, um, basically 36 plus years. And of that, we had the first Haitian vote in 1972. This is a community, though, that has achieved so many firsts. You know, the first Haitian American ever elected to public office mm -hmm. in modern, you know, history in the United States. States, um, Philippe de Rose. Then he became the mayor of the village of El Portal. And then the next year in 2001, we have Joe Celestin, who becomes the mayor of the first sizable city in the United States, which is North Miami, which today has yes. a majority, um, you know, Haitian city council. And then we've got Jean Monestine, who becomes yes. the first Haitian American. And then we just put Marlene Bastien on as the first, the second Haitian American, but the first female Haitian That's American. Right. So, and this was a community of quote unquote boat people. You know, these were not the elites. These are not the people who got on the planes and left Haiti during a dictatorship and went to New York, you know, which basically that migration started in the 60s and 70s. But what I learned from the story and by tracking down one of the original people on that boat is that this community was given birth by the African-American community, black pastors who received them along with the, the, the Archdiocese of Miami. And then you had Haitians from New York who came in and says, you know what, those Haitians in Miami, they need our help because what yeah. people don't realize the whole U.S. immigration policy of detaining immigrants when they arrive in this country, whether they're Haitians or from elsewhere, um, it started with the Haitian migration, 1973. The third boat arrives, and they thought they were going to be set free, and that didn't happen. They were detained in a jail in Florida, and then they were sent to Texas, and they were in detention for nine months. And it was through the activism of lawyers like Ira Kurzban and people like Steve Forrester, who is still around, who's still fighting for, you know, for Haitian rights, that you are able to see what's happening here today. So this 50 years isn't just an anniversary, but it really is a story of a community and how this community is still faced, unfortunately, with some of the same challenges. Both That's people true. are still coming for all intents and purposes. Um, Haitians are still being deported, still being detained, yeah. despite the fact that Haiti today is the place that is overwritten by gangs and kidnappings. Um, we've got a cholera epidemic. Um, you know, come the second Monday in January, the 10 senators that are there, the last of the institutions will be gone. There will not be one elected official in this country of 12 million people. Uh, Jackie, I, I appreciate you telling these stories. You know your stuff, girl. <laughs> you know your stuff. So I appreciate you doing and, and continue to do so uh, because we need to hear the voices from our Haitian brothers and sisters in our community. We need to make sure we continue to get out those stories, yes. and that's what you are doing. So don't stop doing it. Well, thank you. And, you know, yeah, look, Haiti sneezes, Miami catches a cold. That's what we've always said. These communities are, are interconnected. People do not want to leave their country. They want to be able to live there. And, um, mm. you know, people look to me, they look to my reporting to continue.
continue to have some hope. It's very difficult in these circumstances. Right. Um, but you, you, you have to hope because everybody can't mm. get on a plane or on a boat to risk their lives Amen. to try to leave. Amen. Ja Jacqueline Charles, thank you so much, as always. You're always welcome here. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you for being interested in this story. And yes, Made in Miami, MiamiHerald.com, backslash Haiti. We have our own channel. It takes about 20 minutes, but it's worth it. It is worth it. You have to check it out. I, I, I am totally impressed. I'm like engulfed in it right now. <laughs> so definitely stay tuned to that. Jacqueline Charles, thank you. Thank you. You got it.